Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. My name is David Van Zant. I'm the president here at the New School. And the New School is really pleased uh, to host grow this Growing Up uh, NYC conference. Uh, our co-sponsors today uh, are the Center for New York City Affairs, a part of the New School, and our executive director, Kristen Moore, will moderate the panel discussion. The Center is marking its 20th anniversary. And uh, it has, over the years, brought in policymakers and grassroots community, grassroots community groups alike uh, who rely on its, on its credible and well-informed work. Our second sponsor is Equity for Children. That is a project of our graduate program in international affairs. It produces research and policy recommendations designed to improve the lives of children in cities around the world. Uh, I'd also like to uh, just call out for recognition today the Child Welfare Watch project that grew out of the Center for New York City Affairs. Um, the CWW offers analysis and solutions uh, to improve services for the city's economically and socially vulnerable children and families, especially in the realms of uh, child welfare, juvenile justice, and homelessness. Uh, we've had a productive relationship um, with CWW, and it has with community-based and city social organizations, city and state, and city and state po uh, policymakers. Everyone involved here shares the commitment to strengthening and supporting families uh, and working to give children in our city the best possible start in life. Uh, the Ch Child Welfare Watch's founder, Andrew White, um, our former director for our Center for New York City Affairs, was selected by the de Blasio administration to serve as deputy commissioner for policy and planning at the city's administration for children's services. CWW's impact is felt across all five boroughs. In 2009, uh, its 2009 report on conditions in the state juvenile detention facilities spurred some badly needed reforms to, to the juvenile justice system. Another 2009 report prompted steps to improve mental health services for families involved with child welfare and family court systems in the city. And currently, the team is part of the city task force working to improve the quality of child care services. It's this kind of constructive engagement that is a part of the tradition, ongoing mission, and future here at, at the new school. We are committed to making the city uh, to making the this, making this city a better place for all of our students, faculty, and all New Yorkers, including the three million New Yorkers who are children. Well, recently, the New York Times special, there was a New York Times special report headline, What Makes a New York City Kid? It offered profiles of preteens, rich and poor, of all races and ethnicities in all five boroughs. One, one child was uh, managing a plot in a community garden. Another was documenting the need, uh, documenting street life as a, a photojournalist in the South Bronx. And another was training for a career in musical theater. I think the takeaway from all that was New York City can be uh, a wonderful place to be young, for dreaming big, and for experiencing all our diverse and uh, everything diverse and dynamic the city has to offer. Um, our challenge is to help all of our city's children realize their potential, including the estimated one-third whose families live at or near poverty levels. Well, it's now my great pleasure to introduce uh, Richard Bury. Uh, he's a city official that's always had a, a great policy portfolio. He's a native of Brooklyn's East New York community, son of immigrant parents, entered Harvard University at age 16, uh, and then after graduating from Harvard, earned his law degree at Yale University. He was the youngest president and CEO of the Children's Aid Society, one of New York's most respected child welfare orgs, organizations. Today, uh, he is the city's deputy mayor for strategic policy initiatives. He is the architect of the Pre-K for All program. He oversees the city's community schools and middle school after school projects and chairs the interagency children's cabinet. I'd now like to welcome to the podium uh, Richard Fury. Richard. Good morning, uh, and thank you, David. We can have another round of applause for David and the New School for hosting us. This is such a great building. I was telling uh, David I used to hang out in here. My sons used to take art classes across the street. So I would come out here and, and pretend I was a New School student. Uh, so thanks again for having us, and I will be here every day, because this is really a beautiful space. Uh, we have all our events here from now on. Um, and thank you all for coming. We're really glad to be here with the Center for New York City Affairs. 
I want to thank Kristen and the Center for hosting us. Uh, we're really excited to be here to launch Growing Up NYC in our policy framework. Uh, everyone, all the cabinet agencies here, all the folks on our uh, the Children's Cabinet Advisory Board, I want to thank you all for your incredible work for bringing us here today. Uh, so as David said, uh, one of my jobs is to chair the New York City Children's Cabinet. Uh, and I've had the honor of serving as the first chair of that cabinet uh, when we launched it about two and a half years ago. Working very closely with our executive director, who we're going to hear from in a minute, Benita Miller. Give Benita a round of applause. He has been very nervous. I know she's very happy that you're all here uh, and settled. Uh, we're going to hear from Benita in a little while, and I want to tell you a little bit about the Children's Cabinet and sort of how we got to this work today. So the Children's Cabinet is 24 city agencies and their commissioners. And the idea of those commissioners come together to work on behalf of New York City children. It uh, includes all the agencies you would normally think of, like the Department of Education and ACS uh, and DYCD, but also agencies like the police department and the fire department. And again, the goal of the Children's Cabinet is to foster collaboration and coordination amongst all these agencies. First of all, we just try to make sure that cabinet agencies are not stepping on each other's toes unintentionally as they do their work. But also, more productively, we've really tried to find innovative and interesting ways to work together to keep children safer and to promote children's development and well-being. One of the core ideas that just tied the work of the cabinet together is a very simple idea that we need to stop working in silos. And it's not enough for schools to only worry about young people's academic development, for the health department to only work about, worry about young people's physical development. So if you want all New York City to truly thrive, you want them all to smile, I love this picture, if you want them all to smile like the child in that photo, we need to find ways every day to think about their development comprehensively and holistically. A mentor of mine once described this very elegantly. He said that government is organized vertically, but people live their lives horizontally. And through the Children's Cabinet, the city has tried to find ways to work horizontally, to find ways to build up those protective factors that children need for healthy development across all domains, while also finding ways to work together to overcome the risk factors that threaten to keep children backwards and to stop them from moving successfully toward adulthood. We've done lots of cool projects over the last two and a half years. For example, in 2014, we launched a Talk to Your Baby campaign to help new families foster healthy brain development. We've distributed for, fee, for free almost 200,000 baby books uh, uh, across, a lot, across uh, the city, through libraries, through ACS centers, uh, in 11 different languages, all as part of our campaign to promote talking, reading, and singing to your baby. We've held baby showers across the five boroughs. I know some of the agencies here have actually hosted some of them. Again, it's an opportunity to bring families together and to hear from different city agencies that are offering services to them and their families. We've worked to coordinate social services in 150 of New York City's community schools, thinking about how schools can be an extraordinary platform for connecting families to social services and working to make sure that we're thinking about how to do that effectively. During the past year, we brought together 10 city agencies, including the police department and the Office to Combat Domestic Violence, to explore policies to address and reduce the commercial sexual exploitation of children, and to ensure that the city is meeting the needs of LGBTQ youth and their families. The cabinet has conducted an in-depth survey of its 24 agencies to, service, to surface service gaps and to make policy recommendations on how to make the city work better for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning young people. So these are just a few examples of the work that the cabinet has been doing. And today, we're here to announce another stage in our work. One of the things that we've all come to realize in working together on these projects is how the city would really benefit from a deeper alignment on strategy among the work of those 24 agencies. We are a big city. And for any city agency trying to advance its work, it's hard to keep track of what other agencies are doing, much less to try to ensure that we're coordinating with one another and reinforcing each other's work. So we tried to imagine what if all the cities work with children, the programs we operate, the investments we make, the policies we promulgate, what if they were all driven by a single unified vision? A clear strategy about what we want for our children who are growing up in NYC. 
What are the protective factors we want children to develop at each stage of their lives? Do all the city agencies that interact with children and their families agree on what those goals are? Are they making investments aligned with those goals? And do we have the tools to hold ourselves and our programs accountable? And what about the risk factors we're trying to overcome? Are we directing the right resources to the right people in the right places and at the right time to make sure that children have what they need to overcome the barrier that can stand in the way of their healthy development? So we do what we always do in the New York City government. We had lots of meetings, spent hundreds of hours of conversation, not only among city agencies, but with uh, staff of those agencies, with experts, with researchers, with parents, with young people, with community leaders, with practitioners, did a thorough review of city data, looked at the research on child well-being, worked with folks like Chapin Hall and around the country, all to try to get us to where we are today, to announcing this framework. The Growing Up NYC policy framework advances three foundational beliefs. One, that we have to think of child development as a continuum. We have to think about what children need at each stage of their lives. And again, not in isolated ways, but to think about that comprehensively. Two, we have to think about what children need in all the contexts and environments in which they live. So not just in their schools, but in their homes, on their playground, in the parks, in, the, in their health clinics, and in the community more broadly. And three, we have to think very, very deeply about accountability. How do we measure whether or not our young people are actually moving towards those goals? And how do we hold ourselves accountable as a city for making sure that we are making investments that are actually driving young people towards the results we want them to achieve? So to do this, the policy framework tries to do a number of things. And we're going to spend most of the day talking about it. I just want to give you some basic overviews. Um, one, we want to highlight a set of guiding principles that we think should animate the way that city works. We want to really identify, really name those protective factors and those risk factors that we think are most important at each of those stages of young people's development. We want to shine a spotlight on those city programs that we think are seeking to address those issues. And we want to indicate well-being indicators that we can hold, that we can use to hold our, ourselves and our investments accountable. With Growing Up NYC, we have, for the first time, a unified vision to help city agencies think strategically about their work together, and a tool to foster dialogue about what the city needs to do to improve child outcomes. We view this as the first step on a long road. We hope it will spark ideas among providers, researchers, policymakers, and activists. We hope you'll help tell us what's missing from the framework. What are the things that are not there that should be there? What are your ideas about how we can more effectively track our progress towards well-being indicators? And what strategies and ideas do you have for us about how we can continue to drive evidence-based decision-making for children and youth in our budget-making and our policy-making processes? So to complement the policy framework, the Children's Cabinet, along with NYC Digital and the Mayor's Office of Operations, have also developed something called the Growing Up NYC online digital tool and a print guidebook for New York City children and families. The idea behind this online website uh, and the physical guidebook is to introduce parents and caregivers to the wide range of programs and services that are available to them, from the time that their children are born to the time that their children turn 24. Uh, and so I want to also thank, so I want to also thank all the folks in New York City government, but particularly New York City Digital and the Operations Department for all of their hard work work to pull those tools together. So not only do the tool and the guidebook serve as, an, as a conduit for families to access services, we also want it to serve as an information tool. We were collecting all this information. We wanted to make sure we were putting this information in the hands of families in a very easy, digestible way. And hope that by giving them that information, it can help inform better decision making, but also help to guide the conversation that parents and care caregivers have with their teachers and with their, with their doctors as they try to make good decisions for their children. I know you all received a copy of the guidebook today as you came in. You can also, if you just Google uh, Growing Up NYC, you'll be able to download the digital guide or go to the website. Uh, we want you to use it, share it with your networks, and really, we really want your feedback, both in the framework itself and on those tools. Uh, we know their work's in progress, and we hope you'll help us make them better as we move forward. 
It is our sincere hope that all of these tools together will help the city and service providers, parents, caregivers, and young people make better decisions, the best decisions they can, to promote children's health, safety, and well-being. I want to thank all of you for being here today, for all of your hard work, all of the work that you've contributed to making these tools a reality, uh, and really to encourage you to keep working with us over time as we continue to make these tools more effective and stronger. We have a great morning lined up. You're going to hear from Benino. You're going to hear from lots of the folks who work to pull these tools together. You're going to hear from some young people to talk about what it is like for them to grow up in NYC and what they need from us. Uh, and uh, again, I want to thank you all for being here. We have a happy Thanksgiving. Uh, and, and, uh, and again, hope you spend some time with us today and uh, have a great morning before we move to Turkey in a couple of days. So thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Bury. We are grateful for your leadership on behalf of New York City's children. I think many of us see our work within this framework. We see the bits and pieces that we carry and look forward to working with the city to make this um, really impactful for our children. Um, good morning. I'm Kristen Morse. I'm the director for the Center of New York City Affairs here at the New School. It is now my pleasure to welcome up to the stage Angel Diaz. He's a Bronx native and a freshman at Gutman Community College. I'd also like to welcome Leon Isaacs, a junior at the School for Human Rights in Crown Heights. They'll be joined in conversation. We've got places right over there for you too. Um, and they'll be joined in conversation with Paul Forbes, the director of Expanded Success Initiative at the Department of Education. Thank you very much for being here. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> so my name is Paul Forbes. I'm director of the Expanded Success Initiative, ESI, out of the Department of Education. <clears throat> We're part of the educational arm of the Young Men's Initiative, out of the mayor's office. And for the last four years, I've had the opportunity and pleasure to be blessed to oversee 40 plus high schools as we look at increasing number of black and Latino young men who graduate from high school, prepared for college and career pathways. And so today, um, I'm gonna have an opportunity to speak to some of the young men who have been a part of the schools, um, the program, and the work that's being done to ensure that they are college ready, um, that's academically, socially, emotionally. And so as you heard, you have Angel Diaz, uh, who was born and raised in the Bronx, and we have Leon Isaacs, who is currently in school at um, the, high, the School for Human Rights in the Wingate campus in Brooklyn. Um, so I just want to introduce um, Angel and any introductory things you want to say about who you are and let our folks know. Um, <laughs> good morning again. Um, I'm from, my name is Angel Diaz. I'm 19 years old. I go to Gutman mm -hmm. College. I graduated from Bathgate, which um, AMS, Urban Assembly of Path and Math and Science, which was in the South Bronx. I'm born and raised in Highbridge, Bronx, down around Yankee Stadium. Good morning, good morning, everyone. My name is Leon Isaacs. I attend the School for Human Rights at Wingate Campus. And I am Guyanese, I'm actually Guyanese, and I really appreciate seeing both cultures and how, you know, on the different perspectives. So that's really, you know, really, you know, really, you know, <laughs> nice about, you know, living here. So yeah, that's really All right, so, so Angel, um, you've mentioned getting the High Bridge, Bronx. Um, we've had some time together, and you have an opportunity to tell about High Bridge. I'm born and raised in Brooklyn, um, Crown Heights. So, you know, we have that rivalry with the Mets and the Yankees and the Bronx and everything. And so that plays out, but I digress. Um, so talk to me about um, growing up in High Bridge. Um, High Bridge is just different. It, that's really all I can say is um, it's a place where I lived in almost, uh, I could say, like the center of High Bridge where most of the crime, the um, all the violence was um, origin, like the origin of it. 
and like people will be outside three in the morning, four in the morning, day like it it will be all times of the day. It will just be a regular time, and it it doesn't change. It's just something where you you will go there and you won't see it anywhere else. Okay. And Leon, so you're a little different. You weren't born and raised here. You came from Guyana, as you said. How long ago was that? And tell me a little bit about making that transition from Guy Guyana to New York City. Um, I came here in 2012, so that's two, um, four years. And the transition for me, it wasn't really difficult because I can remember looking at Disney Channel and just seeing what America look like, looks like. But you know that Disney Channel really doesn't bring reality to you. So when it really came, it was really a culture shock. It really hit me. So that transition was, you know, it was crazy, man. It was, it was but I do appreciate it because at the same time, um, the first, the first couple months in the country, I, I went to a school in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, and that area is really more of Americans, so they, they couldn't really relate to me, so I really didn't feel at home. I just, I didn't really have no friends at the time, so I just went about my business, did my work, and then transitioned into the School for Human Rights, where in East Flatbush slash Crown Heights, that's more of a, you know, Caribbean area. So when I was really surprised to see how the people related to me, and it really felt warm. So that's really what I appreciated about, you know, the transition that, that I've made. So, so that's a good um, spot David, to talk about what you needed in terms of to make connections. Um, and since we're working in the Department of Education and we're in schools, um, I'll go back to Angel. You know, you talked about High Bridge, and again, we talked about going to school, but your school that you go to is far away from where you live. Talk to us about what happened and why you went to middle school or high school at the school you did. And tell me a little bit about your school, your high school. Um, I, I went to a public school in my district and for elementary. And during middle school, when I started my first year at fifth grade, um, I got into an incident where I got robbed. And um, right, actually a block away from the courthouses in 161. And um, it was four blood members, and they took my phone at the time. It was the phone of the generation. It was a sidekick. It was, um, everybody wanted it. <laughs> so, um, you know, I was a fifth grader with a sidekick. I know it's crazy, but um, that's what ended up happening. And my mother couldn't, like, couldn't, um, like, she didn't want me to stay there, just knowing that the fact that that happened to me in that area, even a block away from a courthouse. And so she moved me to a whole new district. Um, I got a safety transfer, and I went to AMS, which AMS was a um, school that went from sixth grade to 12, and it was, it was home. Once I stepped in there, I already knew that it was going to be a place where I wanted to stay the rest of my life, and the um, rest of my education, um, you know, <laughs> public school. So, um, and I actually still to this day go visit, and it's just where I was, it's a community. It's very small. Um, it has about... 60 to 90 students each grade. We get individual attention, and it's just a great place. And that's where I built my family, and I'm happy to call that home. Um, so we'll, um, we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, Leon, you started on this about the connections you made culturally, right, begin to connect with. And you heard what Angel said. Talk to me about um, your school and okay. what that means, that school community. Okay, so. Um, to be honest, my, I forget about my school education in bed -Stuy, right? So let's transition over to the School for Human Rights. <laughs> Similarly to Angel, um, coincidentally, um, I share the same view about my school. Actually, I entered in the se seventh grade of fall. And at first, you know, going into class, you really don't know anyone. But as the year progressed during that time, opportunities have came where I, you know, I went to, you know, into certain programs. But really, of the people in the school, down to my principal, which is a leader, he's from the Caribbean as well. And how he interacts with the students, he knows every student's name, and it's very similar. It goes from six, six to 12. And just having these people come around me, all my teachers, they're very loving. They, they look out for every student you can think of. They really make sure that they help students to understand their real, their real potential and what they can do. So just having the cultural, the mutual cultural similarities really have helped me to feel warm and to really just go about life really normal. <laughs> so I appreciate you sharing that. Um, the deputy mayor made a comment and said, you know, this is the beginning of an initiative where, again, you want to connect the agencies, not just the school, but what happens outside of school, in the community, neighborhood. 
Were there any programs um, or centers culturally that you were able to connect with outside of school to help you as you develop to where you are the 11th grader four years in the country? Yes, yeah, so one of the outside, you know, extracurricular, you can say, activity that I've, it's really comes, stems from my church. Down to shaking leaders and just members in the church is really just helped me to shake each other's hands in here, a really warm welcome. That has helped me. But even we have a, at my church, um, about six of us, six young men also in a group, same initiative kind of that shares with ESI. It's called Game Time. God advanced in my education to impact my environment. And what that does to me um, as an individual is it really makes, makes sense that wherever I go and whatever I learn from anyone in New York City or anywhere that I go is that the knowledge is really important and you can, <laughs> you can you know, twist it and make impact anywhere you go. So you don't just take in knowledge and take in you know, things that you learn for granted, but also to help out each other, just like Mr. Bury and the, all the, the leaders in this you know, building. So yeah. Um, same question for Angel. So you, know, you had your school and you talked about what you have the experiences. Are there programs, agencies, um, that supported you along your way besides the school building? Um, so my, the program that I was really close to and connected to was um, Scan NYC, which um, growing up, it was a place where um, it's a program in different schools and stuff like that. It was an after school program. And it allowed students to come in, mm -hmm. um, spend time, do homework, um, play basketball. It just gave a safer environment to do all the things that you would naturally do outside but you rather do an inside door, inside area where people, you have older adults supervising. And then I actually um, was able to, now that I'm older, once I, I turned 13, I was able to give back to the program and I started volunteering myself. Right. Mm -hmm. right. um, yeah. Leon, we, you know, we, we talk about, again, the family structure and what you need. Yeah. Talk about your family structure. You know, because people talk about the challenges that young people face and say, well, if the family was there and if the community... Talk about your family structure. Um, yeah, my family structure, um, coming from a third world country, um, and my mom and my dad coming from a very large family, that really, you know, and having my mom, my dad's, um, my mom's dad die at a young age really impacted her um, in terms of the way, you know, she, how she finished school, even with my dad, you know. And how that, um, the family structure, right? So how that pushes me now, seeing that, you know, they didn't have the same opportunity that, you know, you guys give me, Mr. Paul, you know, what, you know, the, gov you know, the local government supports in our schools is that, wait, rephrase the question. <laughs> no, 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 so I'm saying about your family, you, okay. you live with your parents, yeah. I mean, what does that mean and how does that work for you in terms of yeah, growing so up and supporting you? My mom, yeah, and my dad, they're not really aware of college, so this is where the programs, you know, they re I rely on them most, you know, to expose me to colleges, expose me to people that will help me on the way. And yeah, that's, you know, they bridge the gap of my parents, you know, this disadvantage of not really going to post-secondary um, school. So yeah, so that's really. Okay. Yeah. And Angel, same question. Like, tell me about your family structure. You know, I've met your mom and your sister. Tell me about that and what the experience is. Um, I was a single child until I was 13. My sister came into my life. Um, <laughs> came into your life. Sorry, I, 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 sorry, I apologize. <laughs> Interrupted no. your life. Yeah, she, um, <laughs> she's my heart and soul, walking, running around. Um, that family structure, my mom's a single mother, has been um, for me and my sister. We've um, gone through a lot of struggle. Me and her had, our whole relationship's been based off trust. So it's been a situation where even though I know she's doing something and she knows I'm doing something, we, we know that we're doing the best we can for the family as whole. And that's really what we care about because in the end of the day, it's all about my little sister because I'm trying to give her a better life than I can even have. So. Oh, yeah, can I say something as well you know, that I forgot? Please do. Please do. <laughs> um, really, what, you know, there's a difference with my family structure, um, my family structure that I have currently and the family structure I will have. Even though my parents have a different way of family, you know, the family structure, 
Um, it really depends on me to start a new way of what a family really looks like and, you know, to help these programs, you know, which have built me up, you know, to do that when the future comes and when that fatherhood and, you know, motherhood, whoever, you know, <laughs> takes that place, you know, <laughs> will really, you know, I, yeah, so yeah, that's really my future, you know, that's what I see doing, you know, just help filling in the family gap and having, you know, a very similar, you know, view of what a family, you know, really is in nurturing our children. So, um, as I mentioned, you know, so I'm the director of the Expand Success Initiative, working with over 11,000 young men throughout, um, across the city, and I'm, I'm knowledgeable about the programs that are at these schools, right? So, um, Angel, you know, we have the Emoja program, which is the Emoja Brothers, mm -hmm. right? Um, talk to me about the Emoja program, Emoja Bro um, Brothers, and what that means to you, and again, how that supports you in your trajectory. How, you know, where were you before? And what does it look like afterwards, and where are you going as a result of? Um, what, I just wanted to point out, Emoja saved my life. It's that simple. Um, Emoja it means unity, and this is a peer mentor program between about 20 brothers of color. We all go up at um, up to a forest, and we literally camp for a week, and we <laughs> have no phones, no <laughs> connections with the city, and it's an environment where we can. Feel, walk the street and feel like I can't get shot, basically. So it, it's somewhere where I can, we can all sleep at peace. And this program, the people who made the program, which is Ingrid Chung and Terry Rusiel, and Mark, they, th those are my mothers. They with, are in the school, they have yeah, what role they have? In the they're school? all um, assistant, principal. assistant principal, head of dean, and another one is assistant principal, and then um, Melgar is the math lead. Yeah, yeah, she's, they're all amazing. <laughs> um, and they showed me a certain path where I knew that I didn't have to take a certain route and I could take this one. And they helped me become the man and I am today. And then they introduced me to Paul Forbes <laughs> and where he took it to another level and allowed me to be the best version of myself. I'm trying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, and just to say, you know, so these are teachers, administrators at a school that said we have a need, took young men. Angel actually was part of the first group that should have gone in the first year because of family situation. He wasn't sure about that, and so he didn't go with the first 20. And by the next year, he saw what a difference was being made in the school and was begging to get into the, last, the next cohort. And now he became one of the Mojo brothers. So um, I'm glad that um, Angel's <laughs> part of that. And, Talk about, again, your school with um, ESI or the work that's being done there to, again, create these communities yeah. of support. Um, I want to emphasize on when, when Mr. Forbes say this about um, my school. There is a woman by the name of Ms. Jennings. Um, <laughs> she really looks out for us. She's like the mother of the school, you know. She comes to every student, whatever she asks of your interest from since ninth grade, if she know, knew you from the middle school, she asks you what is your interest, and then she goes out there and looks for grants for the school. She looks out for programs that could get you involved after school. And also there, there's a program called Trio, College Now, and all these different programs that, you know, you know, from one stem and then they just branch out everywhere. So it's a whole collection of these programs, you know, that just fit in the right places to make you the person that you, you know, destined to be. Okay. So, you know, Oftentimes we, we come into programs and we talk about what's happening, you know, we have a beautiful picture and that's nice and nice pictures around us, but we have a reality, right? Living in New York City and recently um, a, one of our Moja brothers was murdered, executed in the Bronx, Mount Eden. I um, might have heard about it, JJ. Um, didn't know when I saw the news because they said he was 22, but he's really 19. Um, and one of your brothers, so talk to me about that experience and what that's been and how, again, supports have, you know, again, things will happen in life and, and you'll have death, and you'll have tragedy. How has that helped and supported you? Um, when this tragedy happened, um, I had got called from my mother, the mom, the Terry Rusiello, and she calls me and the first thing we talk about is what can we do for the boys? <laughs> um, that's the first thing we did and we trying to figure out we wasn't prepared for this. We didn't even, we didn't, who is, and we never thought one of our brothers would have um, been this person. And 
it's just, um, the first thing we was trying to push was motivation. Show that even though everything we're we doing is still not good enough, and we have to push more. And that and that's what we was trying. That was the message we was trying to send the boys, because this um, JJ was someone who had already graduated. He had his life together. He had a girlfriend. He was ready to build his family. Hostos and college, right? Was, was that Hostos? <laughs> he was at yes. He was at Hostos College, and he was and he had he was the 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 point of the program to have someone go out and start building their life on their own as an individual, and it was snatched away from him. And so, the supporting cast that we try to get, we as a group, we went to the wake, we went to the funeral, we went to the church as one. We that's our brother, and anywhere he goes, we go, and that's how we felt. Yeah. And, and, and again, we, you know, at some point we were talking about um, violence. Again, I'm born and raised in Crown Heights, um, <laughs> and so I know what Crown Heights in the '70s and '80s, and I've seen yeah. the transformation. Um, my parents are still there. I know Wingate when it was still a big school and how it's changed. But you made some interesting comments when we were speaking yeah. earlier about. Guyana, New York City, and why you, you feel more of a connection yeah. here, based on, even though we hear a lot yeah. about this stuff, but tell me about, and talk to us about that. Yeah, growing up from Guyana, um, I actually grew up in a village that is, you know, recognized as one of the most terrible. But what is interesting for me from the inside is that even though my family were there, my grandma, and our family had some different values from other people in the community, and even though there was crime, there were thieves, you know, all of that, at the same time, I always felt safe at the same time for some reason because I had that family there. And even though the community, they, they always, they, you know, the bad things always, you know, pop out more than the good. So just coming from that and seeing that the black youth in, um, in every um, part of the world, you can say, they share the same crime because of, you know, coming from a lower class, and coming from lack of education, lack of programming, since it is a third world country, there's a lot of corruption. So there's really no access for the youth. It's really, you know, the economy is really slow. So that's why, you know, these people, they, they look for alternatives and it's always the bad ones. Yeah, so that's really the connection. And now moving to um, Crown Heights, you know, living over here, I've seen, I witness, I live gentrification because in my neighborhood, that's why I applaud people that come from the, the worst parts of Brooklyn, like Brownsville and these areas. I applaud them when they attend school and to do what they're doing because I don't know if I can do the same thing. And that's, that really pushes me and appreciate where I live, you know, to help others, just like Mr. Paul does. Thank you, sir. Um, so for, I, I want to take a second to acknowledge some of um, Leon's classmates and teachers who are here from Human Rights. Where are you guys? Just raise your hand. So over here, they came to attend. And I have mm -hmm. other colleagues and stuff from the Department of Ed, but I want to especially recognize um, Vincent Dees, who is from one of our ESI schools also, who's worked with NYC Men Teach um, to help mobilize and bring in more men, men of color who are in the classroom, um, as you've heard the experiences of what happens when you have that kind of transformative relationship. Um, so we have a few minutes, and I just want to say, if, if, if you were going to write home to friends back in, in, in Guyana, or if you had to, now you're at Gutman College, your assignment was to write a letter and talk about what advice you give to New York City, young people, your peers, your sister, if you write a letter to your sister about what she needs to do or what support so don't make the same mistakes or whatever it be, what would you talk about, starting with Angel and then with Leon? Like, what, 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 what piece of advice would you say Growing up in New York City, what should you do? What should she look for? Um, so if I was speaking to my little sister, I would probably tell her to look out, to be more open-minded. I think that's one of the hardest things for people of color is to ask for help. And um, I think that's something that we should all take into consideration. And I think, you know, just looking for somewhere where you feel welcomed is also important. It's a lot of hate in this world, and I think sometimes you have to look for the love yourself. And she, I don't know, it's my sister. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, I, I just want the best for us. So it, I would look, I actually go out now and look out for programs. I think that's also another part to it is 
um, the parent's job is to go out, look out for the programs. The, the New York City does offer these programs. Sometimes it takes initiative for the parent to go out and look for it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, similar to Mr. Diaz, um, <laughs> the same thing. I think, you know, in New York, it's very vast. Um, I speak about a lot of things with my friends. Like we say that New York is a really big place, and you can just go out and speak to people. But an um, interesting thing that I've observed on the train real quick is that people are very introverted when it comes to the underground. And I was just like, wow, that's crazy. <laughs> they have people from Wall Street, different places you can speak to, and you know, just exchange some kind of knowledge on the way. But back to the question. <laughs> Please. The question. Take your time. Continue the question on whatever was, you want to. You know, the question I, was about if you were riding okay. home to Guyana and they said, you know, you're going to come. You said, you told me that when you came here, you thought that, again, like, like my oh, parents, Disney the streets were paved with gold and this is a beautiful. <laughs> and then you came here, you're like, whoa, wait a minute, what just happened here? Yeah. So, but if you're right, but, but again, you're, you're well rounded, right? And your support. Talk to me about what you would tell yeah. um, your friends if you were riding home to them. Yeah, what I would tell friends, this is not a pretty place. <laughs> this is not where people are going to say, oh, come in, you know. This is a place where you have to, you know, go and get it. Go get whatever you want. This is a place where dreams can come true, but it has to come with that inner grit, like you're hungry for, you know, whatever you, you want to acquire. So, yeah, that's really the main thing that I would stress to my friends back in Guyana. Okay. So I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to say as we wrap up, you know, society will, is judged by the way we treat our most vulnerable, right? Our young people and our elderly. And what I know, again, being born and raised here, and I travel to a lot of conferences, a lot of um, meetings outside of New York City, love to drive, gonna be driving to Louisville in a couple of um, days as we go to Muhammad Ali Center for a, a mentoring conference where Angel joined me last year for that trip across country. Um, what I know is that this is a great city. I love coming home, right? I, I drive and it can be tough, gridlock, a lot of stuff that goes on, but I love New York City. And one thing is that we have, again, a government that creates spaces and opportunity programs for our young people. We may not always agree on how we're doing it and how far, how intense, but we know we have that opportunity. And so I recognize that. And again, I'm honored to be part of the Department of Ed and the ESI program. Um, but one thing I want to say, the common thread is, you know, for folks that are in schools, Schools, what you heard is that in spite of what's going on outside, schools can be that place where you create a home for those who may not have that. And so it's incumbent on us and whatever agency we're in to make sure that we're making those connections, as you heard these young men, not just about the schools, but also what's outside, whether it's a church community, faith community, whether it's the CBOs, to make those connections and make sure we know one another because our young people are looking to us to give them those support. So I just want to say thank you to Leon. I want to say thank you to the Angel, and thanks for giving the opportunity to come and share with you. Thank you, Paul, Angel, and Leon. We really appreciate your willingness to share your experiences with us here today. We're going to give you a short break. We're going to invite you back up onto the stage when we do our questions and answers with the audience after this next panel. Um, I love that Leon's classmates and teachers are here as well, so I hope that in the Q&A we hear from you as well. Um, so can I get one more round of applause for these inspiring young men? I'd like to call up our next panel. Um, we have Cecilia Clark. She's the president and CEO of the Brooklyn Community Foundation. We have Ann Williams Isom, the CEO of Harlem Children's Zone. Jeremy Cahumban, the president and CEO of the Children's Village. And Benita Miller, executive director of the Children's Cabinet in the Mayor's Office. All right, so that's a tough act to follow, folks, but I know you're up to it. Um, I want to keep us connected to that urgency and that spirit that Leon and Isaac brought to the, um, I'm sorry, Leon and Angel brought to, our, to the table, and um, ask for each of you to get us started with a brief comment. It can be directed to Angel or Leon, or it can be a statement about the issue that fuels you. I know you all bring that same fire to your work. 
So, Anne, it looks like you are ready to go. I'm ready to start, but did they leave the room? I think they left the room, so I'm not going to be able to talk to them, so I'm going to pretend. Um, what it reminded me, I have a comment and, a, and a, just a few comments and reflections. One was, I was thinking about how Jeff Canada, when he was thinking about the Harlem Children's Zone years ago, it really wasn't about a school or one program. It was about how do we change a community and how do we take 97 blocks so that it can be a safer place to raise children? Because he was thinking, if kids don't feel safe, if there are no quality education, if we don't have health care, if we don't have proper housing, how are we really going to be a strong community? So I, I was thinking in that moment about the genius of what that looks like in terms of surrounding these young boys and, and our children that we serve in our 97 blocks with a safe community. I was thinking about the word safety a lot and the story of the stolen phone and the story of the death of a young person and how that happened so much and how I think one of them, I think it was Angel, or maybe, maybe it was Leon who said that they just wanted to be really normal. And so I, I sometimes get challenged when we're in places like this because we're like, what do kids need? And anybody who's a parent or who loves children, we know what kids need, right? They need everything, they need it all the time, and they need it consistently, right? Anybody, <laughs> amen? And so when we're like, well, what do kids in the inner city need? They, see, they need the same thing that all of our kids need. And Jeremy and I were just talking about, I have a 14-year-old, 21-year-old, 24-year-old that I'm raising in Harlem. I was raised from West Indian parents in Queens from a single mom. All of those things that my mother needed, a good education, support from our Catholic school, you know, support from our, the church and everyone is what I really, it reminded me about this. The other thing was Miss Jennings. I don't know where Miss Jennings was, but I was thinking about the Miss Jennings and the principal. I guess it was in Leon School. And someone who's a caring adult, who they felt loved them, right? He didn't talk about a particular curriculum. He didn't really talk about a particular strategy or intervention. They remember the relationships and the people. Hey, Leon, I'm talking about Miss Jennings. <laughs> and I think Miss Jennings is the secret sauce. <clears throat> and that, that is what it takes. So anybody want to? Yes, you can clap for that. When we're trying to figure out what do kids need and how do we do it. And, um, and I think um, I, just, I just love that. And the reminder to me, the last thing, was that JJ's life, when I think about that, that he went through the program, that he was on his way to school, that he had a girlfriend, that he was going down that right trajectory, reminds us that this work is not done and that we have to keep on and that our kids are worth it. So those were just some of my comments. And thank you both so much for what you shared with us today. Uh, good morning. I, I have to stop being on panels with Anne because you're such a hard act to follow. <laughs> no, we were just on another panel about a year ago, so I'm delighted. Um, and thank you, Kristen, for inviting me and Benita. It's so nice to be here. Um, you know, one thing, uh, I'm Cecilia Clark. I'm president of the Brooklyn Community Foundation. Um, we have a huge uh, portfolio that focuses on young people. Um, but prior to that, I also, I'm kind of wearing two hats. I also ran a young women's program called Sadie Nash Leadership Project. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I think one of the things that we need to keep an eye on is um, not only the vulnerability of youth, but also the fact that actually youth are our greatest asset. Um, they are, in fact, the next generation that are gonna be leaders. Um, but also they are fundamentally the greatest source of information that can help guide the services and the policies. And I just want to say something kind of funny. When I first heard about the children's cabinet, I thought that meant it was going to be children. Um, and, uh, and we laugh. But in fact, what I would really, really want to continue to promote, and of course I've got the bias of having run a leadership program for young women, um, who really in many ways ran that program, um, that we really, really need to young pe we need to listen to young people because they are truly the experts about their lives and their futures. Um, and that also, I think as a collective, um, they're even greater than the sums of their parts, that I think the collective power that they can bring um, uh, in terms of leadership and in terms of experience and expertise, um, I think is something we really need to listen to and I think we need to provide opportunities for that collective power. Thank you. It's great to be here. So, I work with the kid that stole that beautiful sidekick from Angel. 
That's the work I do. Um, Children's Village, Harlem Dowling, Inwood House. Uh, we work, we are embedded deeply uh, since the 1830s, deeply in the juvenile justice uh, space in foster care and juvenile justice. We also work in the Netherlands, Australia, Haiti, and across Latin America. But New York City is our home. This is where we were founded, so we are very New York City-centric. And I work in a system where African-American boys, um, domestic, you know, so these are boys that are born, not boys, of, uh, boys and girls of first generation, immigrant families. Uh, these uh, young people, uh, these boys and girls enter foster care and juvenile justice faster, they penetrate the system to higher levels faster, they stay longer, and they often um, age out uh, with very poor outcomes. Um, we work in the 13 to 14 community districts that feed 80 to 90 percent of the social welfare human service community. And that includes those young men and women that are often in and out of the system. With that group, what I don't always see is the enthusiasm and the opportunities that Leon uh, described in his, uh, and Angel too, you know, parents who feel empowered to make those choices, to choose, uh, choose neighborhoods so that their children do better. Parents who have the confidence to navigate the system to make sure that the resources that are identified in growing up New York, uh, NYC, are embraced by the family. And that group, I think is a group that uh, I'm happy to talk a little bit more about because uh, Leon Angel, you represent what I think we want uh, New York to be, right? You represent the great diversity of this city and the enthusiasm that together uh, we can do a lot of great things and that a family can choose to do better when they have access to the right resources and they're connected to the right people, and when that family feels powerful enough to make decisions. I mean, that's the story of immigration in this city, right? It's not a story of poverty. If, you, if this conversation today was simply about poverty, I think we should turn around and go away, because this city has raised millions from entry to success, so very poor yep. to poverty. Yep. But not if you're a family that is in a racially segregated community that doesn't have access to resources or opportunity or the barriers to opportunity are so high that you can never get above it. So, um, I don't know how to, so I'm Benita Miller, but I don't know how to um, top all of what they said, but just to join what they've um, discussed in thinking about growing up in NYC, when we set out to do this, and Miriam, what um, Deputy Mayor Beery spoke about, we wanted to create a context for the work that we're doing as part of the Children's Cabinet, but also reflecting on our previous work experiences. Um, I, like Cecilia, worked in the community with young people. I represented young people in family court um, as a child, children's attorney. I also ran the city's foster care system for a while. And what we wanted to really do is set out to think about ways that we can knit together some of the programs and resources and to think deeply about policy. When we set out to do that and we started talking to uh, the providers, the, the different stakeholders, particularly the young people, what struck us was their greatest concern was being able to grow up in NYC, um, particularly around access to services, access to education, and access to housing. So I think that one of the things that what um, Deputy Mayor Beery talked about, this is our starting point. We want this to be a living document. We want it to be a document that is fluid enough to respond to the needs, the ever-changing needs and the dynamic um, experiences of growing up in NYC. Thank you. 
We're going to cover a lot of ground over the next half hour, and so we'll have a chance to come back to these issues and give you a chance to elaborate. But I want to start by focusing on transitions, and this is actually one of my favorite parts about the way that this policy framework is organized. It's around the, the uh, developmental land, landmarks in, in young people's lives, but also these transitions when they go from one setting to another, from high school to college or career. So it's also a time of vulnerability and an opportunity where young people can get lost and become disconnected. Um, and I know that the Harlem Children's Zone has long sought to support young people um, across these transitions from cradle to career. Um, what have you learned? Is this a fruitful place for us to focus our efforts? Yes and no. I keep on saying I think that kids need that support all through transitions, in between transitions, at the beginning, at the end. I think what I have found is that those points are very difficult. And I run one agency. For those of you um, who don't know, it's 97 blocks in central Harlem. So it's a place-based strategy. So I see my kids at the grocery. I see them at church. I see them, and I bump into them all the time. So if we have a parent, and I was going to say parents go through these transitions and need support through these transitions, who's in our baby college program, which is a nine-week program for, for when you're in, um, pregnant up until three years old we're able to work with them and talk a little bit about why it's important to, to sing and to, and to, and to talk and to, to do all of those things with your babies. But we also know that we have to build redundancy into that pipeline because something's gonna come up again when the young person goes to kindergarten and maybe they're not speaking as much as we thought they would. How do we get them connected to services right away? What is that early childhood program going to look like? What happens when they go to elementary school? How do you pick the right school? What comes up in that? How, what are the, the, the right after school programs to connect them through. And I think one of the things that we've learned is that it goes on. So even when you think you've gra they've graduated from college, you think that they're good, they look strong, they're doing everything that they need to, they go into college, and then many of them we're finding are not just stumbling because of not lack of academic preparedness, but some of the lack of academic skills. And so how do we make sure that we're going through that again, this difficult time of what does it mean for some of them to be away from home, to be in an environment where maybe they are most first generation college you know, goers? haven't been in this environment, don't really know how to study that, that well. All of these things and all of the personal things that they may be going through. So I think the key that I've learned is that redundancy is important. Kids' lives are not like this. It goes like this, just like with all of us. So how can we build a pipeline that keeps them tightly in that pipeline and keeps us putting a safety net around them, allows them to fail because they're gonna fail and to be there for them as they're going through the ups and downs of life, for them and for their parents and for that whole entire community. Jeremy, do you wanna jump in? I know you do a lot of work with disconnected young people and think a lot about this. Uh, yes, I would. Um, so I'll, I'll make it really quick. Uh, you know, New York City has the highest number of young people who are disconnected. So these are young people that are not in school or not matriculating out of school, not employed, and can describe an aspiration. And uh, you're welcome. If you haven't seen the research, you should, because it's, it's a stunning number. What we find to be the key um, to, to preventing disconnection is not just the service array, as growing up New York, NYC has described quite beautifully. I mean, we, we are a very generous city. But if you don't have one stable, appropriate adult relationship in your life that stays with you, that gives you unconditional belonging, you are lost. You are absolutely lost. It doesn't take much when you're poor to fall down and not actually get up again. It really doesn't take much. When you're a child, and I'm, I'm looking at childhood from 0 to 24, as Benita has described it, and that's the, that's the appropriate uh, time frame, what you need is one person in your life. Government can't pick you up. You know, the power to succeed is not something that's given. The power to succeed is a fire that burns within you. And the person that lights that fire and keeps it burning is the people that love you. So if we can't create at least one stable adult relationship for every kid, we fail. We fail that kid. I know the kids at Children's Village that fail. It's the kid to who, for whom we have not created that one relationship. Does anyone want to pick up on that? I know that is such a powerful theme, and it, it certainly is the framework of youth development, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. I, you know, everyone clearly ag agrees with that. I don't know. Cecilia, you want to talk about it before? I mean, this is 
this is not my area of expertise. I, I guess I just want to say a, a, just a slightly higher level comment, which is, uh, first of all, I entirely agree with, with both of you. Um, but uh, I do think that in all of these conversations, we also have to understand that um, a lot of these disparities are racially based. And that is the picture of what we're talking about. And I think we all, always need to really think about, you know, there are policies and root causes of all of these issues. So even before you get to that one adult, let's understand that there are structural racist policies that are in place that have kept huge, you said yourself about racial segregation. There's a reason there's racial segregation. So I think that we have to think about ways to get that loving adult, but we also have to think about policies that lead to these disparities in these circumstances. Um, I would just add to what everyone has said already. Um, this is fun, because then I could just kind of like, oh, take credit for everything to the left of me. Um, I would say that, and I know you all haven't spent as much time looking at this as we have during the past year, but one of the things that the document highlights are the universal risk and protective factors. And we thought uh, very deeply about for all children, zero to 24, what are the risk and protective factors that either help them along the way or hinder their ability to transition to the next um, opportunity in their lives? And then we also thought about the age-specific risk and protective factors that we needed to look at. And the reason why we really wanted to drill down into some of that um, content or some of the research was because when, when agencies design programs, we want them to understand um, deeply, as a city, what are we aiming to promote or mitigate for children so that when we're designing programs and activities and thinking about policies, that there is a very sophisticated understanding of what matters to the out, what matters for the out, better outcomes for children and also for families so that they understand what we want for their children and how they partner with the city to drive that forward. I agree that government and I think that um, in City Hall, our team is uh, a very different type of team because we do try to be in the community, listening to the community, not that others don't, but we touch family lives, so it's a very different experience when you're doing a baby shower with mm -hmm. women who are in homeless shelters or with fathers or out on Far Rockaway and you actually see the needs of the people and actually get their feedback in real time about what's working and what's not working and how we can right then and there fix things for them, not only for their family, but think about how just even a minor transportation or a eligibility requirement can impact the outcomes of a family and specifically the outcomes of a child. Thank you. I want to I want to stick with the the framework for for a minute. It includes in the back. It's on page 80 for those of you who picked one up. Um, 26 leading indicators, and by the vast majority of these measures, children and young people in New York City are doing better. It's really remarkable. Four-year high school graduation rates have gone from 46% in 2004 to 70% in 2014, with more students graduating college ready and enrolling in college. Risky behaviors, engagement in sexual activity, binge drinking and smoking are also down, and teen births have been steadily dropping since 2000. Now, as Cecilia pointed out, these citywide averages mask a lot of variation. We know that there is significant racial and economic disparities hidden by this data. But I was struck by the consistency and the strength of these trend lines. Um, most of us are, are pretty well versed in the school improvements over the last decade or so, but, uh, but I wonder if anyone here has some insight in what looks to be a change in risky behaviors. <laughs> I think it proves that it means that it was never the kids that couldn't do what they needed to do. I think that mm -hmm. we needed to surround the kids and give them the services and the understanding about um, you know, what 
that what the consequences of the risky behavior are. So um, at the Harlem Children's Zone, we have over 600 different goals that we look at to see how our young people are doing. And so for years, we've been looking at um, rates of either getting pregnant or ca causing a pregnancy, drug use, smoking, all of those, ca carrying a weapon, all of those things. And our numbers, even though we're in the middle of Central Harlem, have always been lower than comparisons with other whites or other blacks or sort of similarly situated um, communities. And Jeff's theory has always been sort of, Jeremy, what you said. Kids who feel connected, kids who feel like the adults in their lives are looking at them, like we, you matter to us and we don't want you to do things that are gonna hurt yourselves, and being able to keep them engaged. So our theory is like be open all year long, be open from early in the morning to late at night so that they can't get involved in some of that risky behavior, keep them entertained with programs and things that they're interested in because if they're with us, they're probably not doing other things. And so I think it, it just proved that the adults need to be in more innovative in what you do in order to keep kids safe and that kids can step up to what we, uh, our expectations. I, I agree. I, I think um, I would also add that it's, it's a great news story, though we don't actually understand the cause and effect relationship here, right? We're not clear as to what has happened, but here in New York City, we can take credit for two decades and now some very prominent leadership from City Hall around this idea of prevention and investment in communities, because that didn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. We've been working on it together. Mm -hmm. Most of us grew up with this idea yep. that rather than separating children from families, we need to go into communities and rebuild those communities. And I think it's paying off dividend. I mean, when I look at uh, the work that Children's Village does through the Inwood House Division, 25 after school programs where we talk, we've been talking to young men and women about the risks of teen pregnancy, the you know, the need to look beyond simply wanting to have a child because that's the best thing that you could aspire to at that moment because everything else seems bad and what you want is love. I mean, this has really paid off and we are seeing similar trends in all urban areas and it, when it comes to teen pregnancy and we should celebrate this because it's, it's really, yeah, really life-changing. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I would say that this is also a wake-up call for us to go deeper. Not all graduations in New York City are equal. We still have a lot of black and brown kids, predominantly black kids, seg segregated in special education in this city, who are graduating with mediocre diplomas that mean nothing. I mean, we know this. And we need to find, fight this social injustice. We, if these numbers make us feel good, we'd be crazy. Because the issues of social injustice have not been erased. And if we don't say this is great, but we fail those kids. And that group of kids is a prison to pipeline, right? Mm -hmm. uh, is, a, is a cradle to prison mm -hmm. pipeline, no question about it. They are filling up our homeless shelters. All sorts of bad things are happening to that group. Let's, let's keep the conversation here on communities because I think this is an opportunity for us to go deeper and I know that many of you have focused your work on particular communities. Um, maybe starting in Harlem, I mean, Anne, can you give us... Okay, should we go to Crown Heights? Let's go to Crown Heights. Take a risk, go ahead. <laughs> Leon led us to Crown Heights, you can keep us there. Yeah, um, Leon, my office is in Crown Heights, so... Um, and actually, to put a proposal yeah, in. we have a program on the Wingate, Wingate campus, so I'll talk to you later, Leon. But um, uh, So one thing that's been interesting to me, I just want to say something about risky behavior. Um, uh, I'm delighted by these trend lines. I think that's really exciting, and I think you're right. I think it's the result of lots of change in policy and lots of hard work. Um, you know, my back goes up a little bit, having run Sadie Nash for, for 12 years, um, that, uh, you know, it's interesting when you run a young women's program, one of the first questions everybody always asks is, so what do you do around prevention? And we didn't do any pregnancy prevention um, because we really were coming at the young women from a totally different angle. Um, a really kind of what you'd say an asset-based angle, a positive youth development angle, um, 
there certainly was a lot of discussion about reproductive justice and that kind of thing. So I, I do think we should be careful when we're talking about risky behavior. I, I'm almost kind of loath to talk about the behavior of groups of people. Um, I think that that, you know, there's a lot of internalization that goes on and I think we should just be careful about that and I think I feel sensitive about it having run a girls program, so I just want to say that. Um, but I'm delighted by the facts. I can't dispute the facts. <laughs> and point well taken. Thank uh, you. Okay. Um, so just something, one of the things that the Brooklyn Community Foundation did, uh, we ran a community, a pretty large scale ambitious uh, community engagement project when I first got to the foundation in 2014 called Brooklyn Insights. We spoke to around a thousand people in the borough as a way of kind of guiding our strategy going forward. And the overarching emerging theme was, of course, young people. Um, and this is across different topics of discussion, across different neighborhoods, um, hence our, our pretty significant invest in youth portfolio. Um, and in addition to, therefore, focusing a lot of our grant making around young people, um, we have created um, a youth fellowship program. Um, and so every year since 2014, we've had a group of young people who have not only done some of their own grant making, um, so this is a completely youth-led grant making program for young people doing um, projects in their own community. So I'd like to really stress youth leadership and political education for young people. Um, but also they help advise us. So we are really looking to young people to help advise us on what is the reality of the lived lives for young people. So taking that a step further, we have created a neighborhood strength program. Um, it's right now in Crown Heights and Sunset Park, but we hope to expand it to other neighborhoods. And that's an entirely resident-led grant-making program. And in Crown Heights, very recently, we just gathered young people. I have an organizer on the ground who's organizing these kind of town hall meetings. And, um, and we just organized young people in Crown Heights. And the number one thing they said they wanted was public space and, and safe space. Um, indoor and outdoor, there seems to be some debate, um, but um, I do think beautiful outdoor public space is still sadly um, an asset for middle class and upper middle class communities in New York. But they even meant indoor, and part of the indoor aspect was um, safety. Um, and I think to be clear, safety from law enforcement, um, also safety from other things happening in their neighborhood, uh, but the desire to work together um, and to produce together and to be together. Um, so it's community in another way of thinking about community. Um, it was quite um, clear from the results. I've looked at some of the conversations coming out of that, but what's also really interesting is it mirrored what the adults were also saying were, was a need in Crown Heights, mm -hmm. was public safety and was public space. Um, so I think that that's kind of a beautiful thing too, that the young people and the residents and the adult residents of Crown Heights are saying similar things um, in terms of overall needs. So that's just a, an aspect of community voice. Can't disagree with that, right? Uh, our, our, all our communities need the same things that my children yep. need. Good, good housing, safe neighborhoods, great public space, good services, uh, no question about that. But I, I want to focus on something that Leon said, because I think, uh, how old are you, Leon? 16. 16. Boy, you're very mature for your age. You said something that, I hope if you missed it, I'm gonna say this again. He said, I love that the underground is integrated. He captures a, senti a sentiment that we, we must remember, that kids who are, segregated do poorly in our, system, in our way of life. Now, there are two types of segregation, right? If you're very poor and you're segregated, it's really bad. If you're very wealthy, you choose to be segregated. Your life is boring, but heck, you can, you can live that way. But to most of us, we love diversity, and poor kids, especially black and brown kids who are segregated, mostly black kids who are segregated, do very poorly. The research on this has been consistent for the past decade, our kids, we, we've got to break this because what you observed is true. You need to be comfortable with the great diversity of the United States and the great diversity of our world. Look around you, the people around you is what the world looks like today. And if you are not comfortable with that, if you have never been around it, 
It is hard to be confident in that space. I see that. Most successful families of color make sure that our kids are integrated, that they're comfortable around diversity. And we've got to figure this thing out for our few kids. It's not a huge group, but they, they are in about 14 of our community districts. They are certainly in, I, I work within and space in the 97 blocks of Harlem Children's Zone. We know some of the schools that are segregated, and we've got to change that, because that, by the way, is going to take us two decades at least to change. No question. So can I fuss with you a little bit? Yeah, please. <laughs> As a woman who moved to Harlem because I wanted to be in an African-American community, the mecca of African-American culture in this um, nation. So it, I really don't feel like it's the act of segregation that's bad. I think concentrated poverty is harmful. When there's, and we know the trauma that it caused, the toxic stress, the lack of services, but I don't want anybody to think that I don't love being around and living with black people. That's why I moved there. So, and our theory of change, Jeremy, I know that's not what you're saying, but I'm fussing with you and I'm being provocative, Good. is that I want to send, I, I, I want to end generational poverty. That's what the goal of the Harlem Children's Zone is. I want to send all of those kids to college, not just some of the kids, not just Mookie on 125th Street. I want them all to go to college, and then I want them to come back and live in Harlem. I want them to come back and live in Harlem so that we can have a community, just like the white people who want to be segregated and bored and raise our kids in that boring way. So that is sort of my vision. So say something, Jeremy. Go ahead. I, I, I love it. So, so this is where it gets interesting, right? Anne is so right. When you are a family of color that can choose, you are doing fine. When you're a family of color Who's, who has no choices and limits are imposed on you and segregation is imposed on you, you don't do fine, right? right? So you talk to the street vendor that's uh, the food cart uh, immigrant that says, my child is at Columbia, they're happy to be serving food, but they have, they have grasped onto the great promise of the United States, which is that I will bust my butt right. so that my kids will do better. Your mother did that. That's exactly right. My mother did that for me. So did my father. But they did not live within the choices that were imposed on them. That's the difference. That is the difference. So we need to make sure that more of our poor families can choose. And they can choose to be segregated by all means. My brother-in-law's family, my brother-in-law is black and he often talks about the choices his family made to move to be in a school district where they knew their kids would do better. Yeah, and Choice let me just matters. say, the point about exposure is of course important, right? And that's why we make sure that our young people have the opportunity to get out of the neighborhood so that when they do have those experiences, they don't feel like, oh my God, I never saw a white person before. Right. Right. Well, that's, we, we do have children course, that yeah. Yeah. don't know how to be comfortable exactly. because they've never been exposed. That's right. Let's, let's keep talking Something about... Something provocative, maybe? Sorry, <laughs> sorry, Kristen. This is, this is great. Um, let's keep talking about poverty. Um, one of the key indicators selected mm -hmm. by the Children's Cabinet, um, child poverty is one of the very few without a clear trajectory. Right. Both yep. the federal measure and the CEO measure have bounced around, but really haven't fundamentally shifted. The CEO mm -hmm. measure is five percentage points lower than the federal one and shows one in four children in New York City living in poverty. We know in particular communities, it's as many as half of children. Mm -hmm. um, now, one of the differences in these two measures is that the CEO measure reflects a broader range of our social safety net programs. Food stamps, housing subsidies, tax credits, these federal programs do indeed reduce poverty. I think it's fairly safe to say we shouldn't be looking to federal increases in anti-poverty programs over the next couple of years. <laughs> Safe. So, given that the resources that we have and substantial local and state commitments and, and a certain amount of flexibility at the state and local level, what more or what different can we do to reduce poverty and to give all families greater choices? Anyone? I'll, I'll, I'll take it and let's, right. let's see if I can be provocative, at least to get Anne <laughs> yeah, yeah. excited here, right? Um, you know, look, we, we built a system around giving more. And I think uh, that's coming to haunt us because we have, there's only so much you can give, right? And there's only so much you can give to the poor. We also need to at least vocalize the reality that poor people love their children. Mm -hmm. 
Amen. Poor people should be able to fight for their children. Poor people deserve our trust because they're not poor because they're lazy. They're often poor because of circumstances that they've been forced into. And so let's, let's acknowledge that, right? I mean, we are a country where millions of poor people actually have found their way out of poverty. I mean, right here in this room, right on this panel, I, I'm speaking for myself, and I think I heard Anne speak for herself too. That is what makes this country so exciting. That's why New York City is the magnet. That's why your parents, Leon, left the Caribbean and came here because they knew that your life could be better. And that's why Angel's mom fought to make sure he's moved. So maybe we need to rethink this idea that somehow that we can create the perfect ladder out of poverty. Maybe, maybe what we need to, maybe growing up in NYC is the opportunity to say, hey, can we align? What I loved, I, I did read the 81 pages, which, <laughs> <laughs> because I was document. afraid, I was afraid that Benita was going to ask me a trick question, and there was only one. There was only one thing that really got me excited because I think a lot of the others are things that we all know, right? Mm -hmm. It's well packaged. It's got some great, uh, great graphics. It's well done. Congratulations. <laughs> but there was well there was one thing. There was one thing that really uh, captured my attention, which I thought was a big lift for government. But if we could do this, it would be powerful. Leverage and align resources. Mm -hmm. We do a lot. We do a lot. This is not a city that doesn't do enough. But we waste a lot because of misalignment and because of a lack of focus. Mm -hmm. um, I am not going to take on poverty. Um, because it's so complex. I would just go right back to my broken record around racist policies and generational, maintaining entrenched poverty generationally, um, really, among people of color in the city. But um, uh, I do just want to say one thing um, that we're focused on at the foundation and that also came out of the Brooklyn Insights work is we have to stop confining and jailing children. Um, it is a huge contributor to the disruption of family and community um, stability. It's not only the life of that one child, but it is the life of all of the other community members around that child and children. Um, and Brooklyn, you know, <laughs> Brooklyn is a huge supplier into this system. Um, it is something we were desperately working on at the foundation, even with moderate assets. So one thing I'd say is, we need to have the political courage to stop confining children. And I mean children all the way up to, you know, let's call it 25 years old. So pretty ambitious about that. Um, the other thing about Brooklyn, and again, I have to wear my Brooklyn hat, is Brooklyn is almost 40% foreign born. And if you think about the barriers that would um, attach themselves to anybody who are approaching poverty or in poverty, um, you can imagine that those barriers are two and threefold for immigrants, whether it's language, whether it's documentation, um, harassment. And um, so I also think that we really need to focus on the rights of immigrants. And I think, again, I'm just going to say, looking at the next four years, I don't think we can look to the feds for that. So I would say that New York City and New York State really, really have to look at how to provide safety and opportunity for its immigrant population. And then finally, you know, I think minimum wage is important. I just want to say, I don't know how much philanthropy is in the, in the room here, but one of the things I'm hearing from a lot of my really superb youth organizations is that they pay their young people as they should, and they pay them minimum wage as they should, and we can all say that it's phenomenal that the minimum wage has gone up, but understand what this has also done in terms of a hardship for these youth-serving organizations. So, and I'm not convinced yet that the government's gonna be able to fully close that gap. So I would say to philanthropy in the room, make sure young people continue to get paid. It's so critical for their families, but make sure we can help these nonprofits cover this good news about the minimum wage, but a hardship on the organizations. Um, I was just going to, if I can, comment on the indicators work. I think um, you all touched on everything that we were thinking about when we came up with the list of indicators. And the main thing is we do want to go deep. We want to use the 
the very positive trends to look in neighborhoods or in communities where we could go deeper with the work. And also what Jeremy spoke about, how do we align all of this? How do we make sure that the investments we make are actually doing what Ann said, which is like the children, I didn't even think about it that way. The children are responding positively to the efforts we're making to ensure that they have positive outcomes. But in certain communities, how do we then uh, build programs and investments that matter so that we can go deeper in those communities. So those are some of the things that we are thinking about. We're also thinking about um, children and incarceration, both from the perspective of parents who are incarcerated and how are they connected to their child's experiences, as well as how are we preparing young people who are um, just as involved in coming home while they are um, involved with the justice system, what do we need to do to make sure that that does not um, minimize the opportunity, the lifelong opportunities that they will have. We also think about young people and their early parenting, even when the trend lines are going down, and the impact of making sure that they're prepared to parent so that they are not involved long-term with our child welfare system so that we minimize opportunities for intergenerational poverty yep. and poor connections to systems that are designed to help families um, with the greatest needs. But sometimes those families, if we don't help them early, we kind of connect them to these systems long term. I think that's a great place to pause our conversation. I want to invite Angel, Leon, and Paul back up to the table. Um, I think we've got a couple of CE, uh, staff members who are going to run the mics. Um, so if folks have questions, please raise your hand. And I think Monet and who else from the centers got this mic? Chancey, can you work with this one over here? Sorry, we've got the mayor's office over here and the center over here. Um, who's got the first question? There we go. In a right dead smack in the middle. I always feel like I'm going to feel Donna who is. Right? I, I love that. Oh, well, we have someone over here if we want to. Okay. Oh. It's a lot of hands in the middle. Okay. Just scream it out. We could probably hear yep. it. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's fine. The acoustics in here are fantastic. We can hear you. Yeah, if someone, yeah just if stand someone, up. If you, if you just stand, stand up, up and we'll yeah, yeah, stand up. Yeah, but if you can yeah. oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. But it's being no, videotaped. Oh, the videotape. <laughs> sorry. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, this is fantastic. My name is Marlon Jenkins. I am here on two behalfs. First, I'm the CEO of Nature, which is a broadband company for low-income households. And second, I'm here as a consultant for Mid-Bronx Senior Citizens Council. So I have, the first thing I want to say is, this is probably one of the most inspiring meetings I've been to about policy in maybe 10 years. Um, I'm 43, I don't look it, but <laughs> <laughs> this is pretty awesome. Um, first, I'm inspired by you guys. I came, my mother's a former crack addict. I understand everything you're talking about. Uh, I'm getting emotional to think about it. Um, I have a tw twin brother who's disabled, um, so we had a very difficult life. Um, but what I notice that I keep hearing about is access, access, access. And as obviously, when I created Nature, the reason why is because we recognize this need. I just want to say something. I had a meeting last week. Um, there was a, um, a Thanksgiving celebration at Community District 7 in the Bronx. And one of the things we were able to do is to talk to as many families as we could about, okay, what do you need? What do you see? Um, and we have, I mean, maybe out of 60 families that came in through this door, 45 of them said they don't understand how to get to resources. Mm. They don't have the connection to the resources. So one of the things we, obviously that's what we build Nature, but also one of the things we were doing inside of Nature is we recognize we can't just give them the internet. Um, even if it's low cost, which it is for us, it's more important that we create an ability to connect them to the resources um, beyond just getting to the internet. So I just want to get, get you guys to kind of think about that a little bit more. Because yes, there are resources and resources and resources, but many of our families, uh, my mother had no idea, right. my brother has no idea, um, families you talk to have no idea. So we gotta find a better way to connect them. And obviously I'm part of that and I'm doing what I can, um, but I think we have to also think about that as well. Because yes, we can create the access, we can create the resources, but the key is how to connect to those resources beyond that. 
Thank you. So can I say thank you for your comment? And you're making me get choked up, too. I <laughs> want to tell you that um, last week we um, had a Thanksgiving celebration. We're in the middle of the St. Nicholas houses. So anybody who knows Harlem, family of four makes $21,000 a year. And in 50% of the households, there's no adult that's working. And so we had a, a celebration where we were like, come on out, we're going to you know, celebrate you. And I think we gave out, I don't know, like 200 or something turkeys. And after I was like, what should I make? This is my first Thanksgiving meal. And they gave me all these ideas. We got them out to celebrate them and then started to talk to them about the different resources. Now, this is a housing project where we're in the middle and they don't come out of their houses or they don't even come across the street. So we were thinking about how do we get them out? How do we do something that's respectful and fun? How do they get to meet the CEO and all the other 2,000 employees and then connect them? So you just reminded me that that's where the work starts is getting people not just the access, but respecting them, being there with them, celebrating with them and being in the struggle with them. So thank you. I also just think um, children are going to school, and I think schools are yes. really, really a big connector. Yes. Um, I know that in my old organization, schools really, really help, not only in terms of doing outreach, but even bringing programs into the schools. Mm -hmm. um, so I really think relying on children's schools. I love that there's been such a focus on community schools in this administration. I think that's great. Um, but even if you're not a community school, I think that there has to be some kind of mechanism, particularly in this vision of breaking down silos where the DOE is speaking mm -hmm. with small community-based organizations and also larger social service organizations. Um, but it's, that is really an opportunity for connectivity. Mm -hmm. Let me just add two things. One is I love hearing about other nonprofits that are just doing great work, right? I mean, we, we, we're not the only people doing great work. We do it together, and m many of us do amazing work with the help of philanthropy and, and government in this city. Uh, I think there are two things we need to tell our parents. Now, again, I want to step back and say, you know, I, I work in foster care and juvenile justice predominantly, and so even in Drew House, you know, in after-school mm -hmm. programs, wherever we are, that's kind of the core group of our work and our focus. There are two things that we want our families to know. One is, if you are depending on government to have a solution for your children's lives, you'll be disappointed. It's not because government doesn't care. That's not a pathway to success. Two, no one fights for your child as you can, and you should. Not Children's Village, I dare say, maybe not even Harlem Children's Zone. No one should fight for your children. Just stay in your own no, lane, Jeremy. No one, should, no one should fight for your children harder than you. That's right. No one. Amen. Can we get another question, maybe from a young person? Monet, up. Oh. Well, we'll take it from you anyway. But the okay. next one, you've got to be under 24 in order to qualify for the question or statement. Gotcha. Um, my name is Kelly, Kelly Villar. I'm from uh, uh, Staten Island. I'm the CEO and founder of the Staten Island Urban Center. Um, my question is, has to do with the indicators. One of the things that, for us, particularly on Staten Island, um, that's missing is the political indicator. Um, we are not like, uh, and I come from Harlem. I'm originally from Harlem, and I know Jeff Canada from way back when. But, you know, we are, we are uh, uh, surrounded, we're not surrounded by a council member, you know, like Melissa Mark Viberito, who very much believes in uh, children's issues. Uh, we have one Democratic um, uh, council representative, a city representative, uh, uh, elected official. Uh, so it's kind of hard in terms of making sure that the priorities and the things that get funded in our community um, are happening, and we rely on very little resources. You know, when they look at Staten Island, they're not looking at the real numbers. You know, they're looking at, uh, they're not looking at the fact that in 2015, there was a Harvard study done on poverty. And they said the worst place in America to be if you are poor is in the North Shore of Staten Island. We have the largest uh, Liberian population. We have a humongous uh, uh, Caribbean population. We're very diverse. Uh, community, particularly on the north and mid-island uh, parts of our borough, and there's a lot of political issues that interrupt with service uh, in, our, in our area because you're talking about a singular school district, you're talking about a political um, uh, representation that does not represent a wide youth agenda or wide children's agenda. Uh, so 
when we talk about indicators, I'm hoping that this group will begin looking at Staten Island a little bit differently because we have a slightly different uh, problem than the other boroughs. So just to respond to you, we did spend time on Staten Island creating the document and speaking to young people who live on Staten Island. And Staten Island is an important community to us, like where well, all boroughs are, all boroughs are equal, right? But um, we did spend time there because we didn't want to miss the opportunity to talk to young people and caregivers and parents who live on Staten Island to figure out what were their needs and how do we, how does this um, framework inform um, new program opportunities, but we do intend to use the indicators. Again, this is supposed to be a living document. It's 81. I know it's long, um, <laughs> but we want it <laughs> we wanted to, to be a foundation for every conversation that we start to have about children, and we will use the indicators to kind of figure out where we need to be doing work in a deeper way. Can I say something, too? Is Let's not forget that young people are themselves a political force. Um, and so I would really lift up organizations that do focus on political education, on youth organizing. These are, they can be political actors and they should be. Um, and in fact, I think there's even, there's some really good research to show that young people that are just the traditional youth development um, organizations, but when they engage young people in organizing, in political activism, actually a lot of indicators and outcomes even improve. So I think that try to think about young people as having political will themselves and organizing them, um, and maybe you can actually get the attention and shift some of the politics um, in Staten Island, but I would say that across the board. Right. And I, just before, I would add, because Paula Gavin will want me to, New York City Service, our youth leadership councils, okay, most yes. of our agencies and our CBO partners now have them. And we did meet with the youth leadership council in one of the cornerstones in Staten Island, but across the five boroughs to make sure that youth leadership, um, their voices were being heard throughout the document. We, we have a number of programs in Staten Island, happy to be part of a solution. I think there are lots of good providers on Staten Island that probably need to come together mm -hmm. and focus on and a couple of things. Yeah, we yeah, can do we that. Can do, that right yeah. do we have another question? Yes, I'm Maria Roque. I'm the founder of the Friends of Sunset Park, as well as co-founder of the campaign to make space for quality schools in Sunset Park. We are one of those communities that for decades has had some of the most overcrowded schools in the city of New York, and now pretty, unfortunately, a place that we don't like to hold, probably the second most overcrowded area of school-wise. So I apologize, I haven't had a chance to look at the report, but um, I would just like to obey, actually, that, um, that this campaign, your um, efforts, work with the schools and, in, and local institutions to look within the community for resources. And one resource in the community is my age group, the retired people, the grandmothers, the young grandmothers, the older grandmothers, the great grandmothers, who have a lot of experience. And the ones who, you, who are most likely gonna come out and volunteer are the ones who've done their job well and who understand the community from within. Uh, Sunset Park, like many other neighborhoods, is extremely diverse, uh, even across its Latin Spanish-speaking community. It is not a homogeneous community, um, even within the Latino community, plus, the Chinese community is growing and probably will overtake the Spanish speaking community in a couple of years. So number two, and I thank you for your patience, is to recruit and demand that the pediat that the, um, uh, the medical professionals that support uh, small children, adolescents, and young adults do their job. I can tell you in Sunset Park and in many other communities that I have business with, they're not doing their job. Children in, the, in 2016 are walking around our neighborhoods with health insurance, with pigeon toes, with cross eyes, with um, 
not having to take a day off from school to have their teeth taken care of. And then the other two or three children in that family are also out of school because mom cannot go around the neighborhood. We need to do better. Thank, thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to cut you off here. I love that you mentioned health. We haven't had an opportunity to really speak about health. Does anyone want to pick up on that health point? And I know we have a young man waiting for a question. Uh, man, but I, I, think that's, I don't mean that's to be disrespectful, critical. but there is one other issue, and that's the low literacy of Thank you. native as well as immigrant parents. It is an issue nobody wants to talk about because they feel that it's an embarrassment, but we need to talk about it and we need to, it's time, high time. Forget teaching people how to speak English out of the outset. They need to be able to read and write in their native language before Absolutely. you can teach them English. Thank you. Thank you. Access to healthcare is a basic human right. We should all fight for it. End of story. I, I don't think we need to discuss this in too much in depth. Okay, if I got these two agreeing, we're gonna move on. <laughs> Thank you very much. We agree. It's gonna have to separate you. Good morning, my name is Oliver. Um, I work for a nonprofit called Cool Culture. Um, what Cool Culture does, we work with over 50,000 families in New York only to connect them with uh, cultural, cultural institutions uh, for free of charge, which otherwise they would not have access to museums and um, uh, zoos and things of that nature. Um, I'm uh, four, uh, one out of four brothers, the first one to actually go to college. Um, and honestly, I'm from Jersey. I just moved to New York about a few years ago. And before that, I had no clue what social justice was. I, I just I was oblivious to, to the very idea. So my question is for the two young men down here. Seeing that you guys, you guys are open, you guys are kind of more free the, around the issues of your neighborhood and, and your community, what do you guys plan to do with, with this knowledge you have now, this, this social justice problems that you guys see around you, what do you guys plan to do in the future with, with the career path you're taking? What do you, how, do you plan to, how do you plan to help your communities? Um, yeah, so to stress on game time again, God and my environment to impact my environment, God and my education to impact my environment, right? Um, that is just a way um, every week we meet and sometimes, you know, you know, if things don't go right. However, what I see myself doing is, is that just understanding what you guys, you know, everyone that, you know, pouring into the youth um, and seeing that we are important, it's just that when I become whatever, you know, whatever I major in, is that even though you're majoring in that, you could still have a second, you know, agenda, or you can use that same major that you're using to impact. So it doesn't matter what you're doing, you can still address the common issue that we all have and we all face. So it doesn't matter, I'm actually interested in being an engineer. And I see that as a pathway, you know, the money, you know, I, you know, it's not just the money, you know, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, but yeah, I'm not just doing it for the money, but the money is very important so that we can fund, you know, and pour into some other young people's lives. Like my mentor stresses um, the importance of pouring into the six young men's lives there. If that's what God blesses him with, so be it. But then it will be a ripple effect and then it will expand from that, just that one person. So yeah, that's really what I see what do us doing. That? That's right. Angel, we'd love to have you jump in, and maybe this will be the last word. I can think of no better way to wrap up this panel than with the two of you. Um, so what I consider what trying to give back to my community is opportunity. I think that's one of the biggest things. Um, once you tell a child that they can do it and they have it in front of them, they're going to want to grab it. It's, it's just hunger. It's, um, it's what that New York swag has. It's, it's, just, it's just what we, we want it, we have to have it. So I think once the opportunities are laid down in front of a child and they are given and they know what this opportunity can lead them to, I think they would grab it. And that's actually one of my main focuses is to stay in the Bronx. I do not want to move. I want to stay there. That is my fight. <laughs> thank you. Thank you to the mayor's office for this framework. We are all going to stick with you and make sure that this is meaningful and impactful. Um, this will be powerful if we all work together to make it so. Um, thank you. Thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you to all of you for coming out. Thank you to these two amazing young men. Uh,